Hello, welcome to um, the Burlington um, Progressive Party Town Meeting Day Candidate Forum. I'm Selena Colburn and I'm a former city councilor from Burlington and currently serving in the Vermont House. And I'm really excited to um, have the opportunity to facilitate this conversation today with some of the folks who are stepping up to run um, at our upcoming Progressive Caucus. Josh, do you want to say, a, give a quick um, shout out about the details of the caucus? And we'll do the same thing at the end, just to make sure I'm not getting anything wrong. Yes, happy to. Um, so for the, this is our Progressive Caucus for people seeking, Progressive Forum for people seeking the Progressive nomination for city council in Burlington. So that caucus is gonna take place um, on the 18th. And if you haven't registered yet, um, you can still do so. You can go on our, um, if you look up Burlington Progressive um, nomination caucus, um, you should see it as a Facebook group coming up. Um, so for this forum, um, we've invited anyone who we heard was interested in seeking the progressive nomination at that caucus on Tuesday. Um, the candidates have all agreed to um, this, this process. So we're gonna have 30 second opening statements. And then um, we're gonna have a series of questions that were actually submitted by people seeking the progressive nomination, uh, by people who registered to participate in the progressive caucus. Um, so Selena Colburn and our elections chair, Carter Nibizer, um, went through and pulled um, questions from, from the ones that were submitted. And they're gonna be, we're gonna be asking candidates those questions and candidates will have one minute to, uh, or two, two minutes to respond to each one of those questions. Um, afterwards, um, we're gonna do 30 minute closing statements and then we will be all done. Great. So with that, I think we can get started with opening statements. And um, Olivia, I'm gonna go to you first. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Olivia Taylor and I want to be Ward 7 City Councilor. I am currently a member of the Housing Board and the NPA for Wards 4 and 7 Steering Committee. I've also lived and worked and rented in Burlington for almost 10 years. I wanna be on city council because I believe in affordable housing, building community and supporting local businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Bergman, over to you. Let's unmute. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Jean Bergman. And first I need to thank Max uh, Tracy for a decade of service to Ward 2 and the city. We're gonna really miss you, Max. I'm excited to be running for Max's seat because I want to use all the experience I've had, not only as a city attorney and a former city councilor for Ward 2, but also as an organizer and an activist to deal with the serious challenges that we face in Burlington. The housing and tax affordability crisis, climate change, systemic racism, economic injustice, and public safety transformation. Together, we have started to, do, to make fundamental changes and together we can do so much more. And I look forward to being part of that process. Thank you. Thank you, Joe McGee. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Joe McGee. I'm your Ward 3 city councilor representing downtown in the Western part of the Old North End. Uh, I'm running for a full term on the council to continue the work uh, that I've started over the last few months. Uh, whether it's addressing the unfairness of the citywide reappraisal and the uh, property tax system and uh, advocating for harm reduction and meeting the most basic needs of our uh, most vulnerable neighbors. So uh, I look forward to the conversation we're going to have tonight and having a, a strong slate of candidates going into March. Thank you, Joe. Allie, how? Hi everyone, um, my name is Allie House, I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm a Vermont social worker, a public school educator, and also a student at UVM, and I'm really excited to be seeking the Ward 8 nomination. 
um, as an active professional within the community, I have seen the real world implication that uh, local policy has on people's lives. And um, so my policy priorities include addressing the climate crisis, um, which I've been active in organizing around um, improving conditions for renters, um, long term residents and college students alike. Um, reducing the cost of living, transforming public safety, improving mental health services, um, and also holding the University of Vermont accountable for its part in community issues. So yeah, thank you. I, I look forward to, to tonight. Thanks, Sally. Zoraya. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoraya Hightower. She, her pronouns, and I'm the Ward 1 City Councilor running for re-election. Really excited to um, continue some of the work I've been doing on renters' rights, addressing the housing crisis, and transforming public safety. And really excited about this new suite of candidates um, that the progressives have, and potentially continuing our work together on on those issues. Great, thank you. So our first question is about housing, um, which many of you have already talked about as a priority, how will you approach making housing more affordable and accessible in Burlington for um, working people, for vulnerable folks, for middle income folks and beyond? And Zariah, it goes to you first this time. Great. Um, so yeah, I think one of the important first steps to working on housing affordability is to work and to get through in the next few months just cause eviction, just because so many of the other things that we could do, whether those are charter changes or ordinance changes, kind of depends on that basic right. It's hard to get anything done around affordability or anything else when you can evict someone at any time for no reason. So I think definitely passing that first. And then I think when that gets passed, I won't say if, I'll say when that gets passed, I think moving on to um, things that ad directly address affordability. Um, luckily, also, if Just Cause Eviction passes, we've got some things for addressing affordability, like helping with moving costs, things like that, that I think will be a good precedent for helping folks generally. But I think ultimately we'll need to look at another charter change to look at ways to actually control the cost of living for folks. Great, thank you. Ali, I can go to you next on this one. Yeah, um, so as many of us are, are familiar with, Burlington is uh, experiencing a housing crisis for sure. Um, and the ripple effects are being felt throughout our whole community and also especially in, in my ward, um, which is, is largely made up of, of students. and. Um, as a renter myself, I understand how affordable housing is out of reach um, for so many. And um, the current mayor's solutions have relied almost entirely on outside developers to alleviate this problem. And so while more housing is going to be part of the solution, we have to make sure um, that we're not gentrifying our city. Um, you know, as, as we're making uh, these decisions. And we also cannot overlook the role that UVM plays in this problem. And so as our city uh, begins renegotiations um, with the school, I wanna fight to ensure that UVM provides more housing for students and that they stop charging above market rates for that housing. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, also um, the mayor's decision to um, bulldoze the Sears Lane encampment was pretty horrific um, and unconscionable and um, definitely um, there there are certainly problems within social work as an institution and um, but as a, a social worker I really believe wholeheartedly that shelter is a basic human right and I want to invite a fight to ensure that um, Burlingtonians are, are able to shelter safely and, and peacefully. Thank you. Thank you. Joe. Thank you. This is uh, an important question and, uh, you know, it's definitely something that I've um, been thinking a lot about in the last four months and uh, certainly as we start up this campaign, um, you know, in advocating for uh, folks at Sears Lane and the houseless community more broadly, um, you know, it's pretty clear to me that we need multiple layers to uh, the housing that we have available in the city. We're not going to build our way out of this uh, crisis with market rate housing. Um, we need, you know, 
better options for folks that find themselves experiencing temporary houselessness um, and uh, allowing for uh, camping on public lands and uh, investing more in permanently affordable units uh, and really looking at what that definition of affordability is because I think with the current inclusionary zoning that we have in the city, it still fails to meet that, that threshold for so many folks. So um, those are a few things that I hope to uh, look at uh, going forward. And, you know, I think we do have an opportunity with uh, the COVID relief money that's coming into the state right now to really make a, a once in a generation investment to um, increase our, our housing stock across the state and uh, really um, make a difference here. So excited to continue that work. Thank you, Dean. Boy, what a great group we've got. This is really exciting. So um, a, a comprehensive housing policy that stands as an alternative to the mayors is being framed up in right in front of us by all of the people that came before me. So I don't need to, to say anything more than I support all of the pieces that you've already talked about. Maybe I'll just add a little bit. UVM's plan that they released in front of the city council is woefully inadequate. There is a lot of land that they can use and a lot more that they have to do. So we have got to stand much firmer with UVM and getting them to house more of more students um, on, on campus. We have a Burlington Housing Authority, which is a public agency, which is an independent um, municipal corporation that the city of Burlington actually uh, uh, appoints members to their board of. The federal government has walked away from its responsibility to fund affordable housing, but this institution exists and has certain authority that we are, are, have really not looked at at all. I, I don't think that we've really looked at a role that BHA could play um, since the 1980s when I was serving with Bernie Sanders. So the idea that we could build affordable housing, really affordable housing for working and poor people through the Burlington Housing Authority is something that I think that we need to look at and we need to continue to promote. Um, we haven't added the, uh, the need and responsibility we have for BIPOC ownership. You know, black and brown people in this state, in this city have minuscule home ownership um, rates. Uh, it stems from systemic racism. So part of affordability has to be our commitment to increase to an equitable level, the, uh, the opportunity that uh, black and brown folk have to be able to own a home and be able to build that generational wealth. And let me just end by saying that, you know, part of what we need to do is also improve the pathetic condition of housing in Burlington that renters like Ali was, were, you know, are, are living in. And part of what we do with that relates to how we address climate change. So there is a, a, um, an ordinance that's working its way through in terms of weatherization and um, in your, your and I'm over. There we go. Right. I could go on, obviously, there for way too long. <laughs> Thanks. Olivia, over to you. Hi, well, like everyone has said, housing in Burlington is too expensive. I also agree UVM does not provide adequate housing for students. I'm going to shift to a low hanging fruit since everyone's talking about big picture. I would really like to make the rental process easier for tenants and landlords by streamlining the rental application process in Burlington. I would love to see some something similar to a common app where you put in information and people can collect the information. Um, my, my landlord actually is a first generation American and I helped him write my lease. So I think there's a lot of things that prevent people from um, becoming landlords and tenants uh, and whatever we can do to make that easier for everyone, including streamlining this process is an easy accomplishment I think we could make. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think I got to everyone there. So moving on to our next question. Um, 
what policies will you advance to ensure that Burlington gets off fossil fuels by 2030? And particularly, um, what policies do you have in mind for the transportation and, and thermal or heating sector where we know the bulk of the emissions are coming from locally? And this time I'm going to go to you first, Jean. Will we'll, we'll get me to be quick on this, uh, by that approach. Um, one of the things we can do is um, change the climate action plan to include airport aviation emissions. E aviation is a huge um, fossil fuel burning um, industry. And uh, right now, Burlington um, does not include their aviation, um, em the emissions of the aviation section in that. Um, right now, the, the, um, the airport is proposing a, um, an expansion that is going to threaten the Chamberlain School neighborhood that um, has already suffered from the F-35s in past expansion. So we, we actually need to stop that. The city council did a good job last Monday of uh, slowing that train down, but we need to actually work on that more. Um, TDM is uh, transportation demand management. And there were some changes that uh, our own Jack Hansen and Zariah um, put forward uh, last year. And uh, there are some new changes that I hope that we can you know, adopt uh, maybe even before this group uh, gets, uh, gets elected and Zariah gets reelected and Joe get reelected so that we can um, really push that. Because if we're going to be giving developers um, breaks on parking, then they've got to be part of the solution for how people are gonna get from here to there. And I guess that the last piece relates to um, uh, housing. And uh, I just wanna say that there is a new zone, uh, a new um, housing amendment uh, that should improve weatherization. And it's that kind of work that I will continue to work on. Thank you. Thank you. Allie. Sure. Um, so yeah, Burlington is definitely at a pivotal moment when it comes to climate solutions. Um, and you know, our, our electricity sector is 100% renewable, but over 90% of our buildings are still heated and, and cooled using fossil fuels. Um, and so currently the state legislature, I'm sure you're aware, Selena, um, is reviewing a charter change um, that's going to allow potentially um, Burlington to regulate um, how how buildings are heated and like cooled and the systems that they use to do that. Um, and so under this, um, Burlington um, would potentially be able to create cutting edge policy to move all buildings off of fossil fuels. And so as a city councilor, I want to ensure, um, you know, if elected that, that I'll be fighting for this to happen. Um, and also that the transition period to clean energy is decisive, rapid, and also equitable. Um, for all folks who are living here. Um, and also, um, I just learned this fact the other day, uh, Montreal triple, tripled the number of people biking in their city just by providing um, like easier access to bike lanes and providing more um, infrastructure that promoted biking. And so also taking a look at potentially what could that look like for our city? Um, yeah, this is an issue that I definitely feel very passionate about. I um, have met in person with uh, Phil Scott, our, our governor, um, related to the, the water crisis that's uh, happening um, to our neighbors in Bennington, um, which is very similar to a crisis that's impacted my own family um, in Wilmington, North Carolina, some of my extended family. Um, yeah, so I, I think now more than ever, we need people in office who are going to remain optimistic about our future um, and who believe that that earth and, and our city is a place worth worth fighting for. And so I really believe that Burlington can serve as a leader and an example. Thank you. Olivia. Uh, Hello. Um, so I definitely have a lot of feelings here, so I'm gonna to try to condense them. <laughs> I personally am very much a transportation nerd. I wrote my undergrad thesis at UVM on the bus while riding the bus back and forth to Montpelier where I interned as the energy and climate change intern at VTrans. Um, there, I really got very excited about uh, looking at 
trains and vehicle miles tax, uh, vehicle miles traveled tax versus gas tax. Those are really big picture pieces. I think that um, the Biden's infrastructure bill has given us money for the train. I think we should be really pushing trains. I have really enjoyed seeing the free bus system throughout COVID. And I would really like to see if that's something we could continue to do. Um, but talking more about climate change itself and what's realistic, I think uh, one of the first steps is to have accessible parks. And part of that is uh, something that I worked on in grad school was edible community gardens. So I wanna see gardens that are not controlled by anyone, but just are located in existing parks and anyone can gather food or um, like lavender, anything like that from it. Something that really makes people um, use our parks for, for something uh, that really benefits them and everyone around them. I think that a lot of uh, addressing climate is just really making our wild spaces more accessible. Thank you. Thank you, Zariah. Yeah, and to also touch on, those are all amazing answers. So I think I'll just try to fill some of the gaps. I think Biden's infrastructure plan, at least the last version of it that I looked at, I think was very much targeted towards carrots and helping some of like some of the wealthier populations reduce their footprint. And I think then being intentional as a city and making sure that we've got an inclusive package. And so I think things like making sure that we continue the free bus system, like have additional like and build that out as we need or any other public transit systems. And then I think the second piece to what Jean was talking about is really looking at our housing stock and that how that ties in with transportation and how we do disincentivize, especially for any new things like you know, just like we couldn't even really build today what we built 50 years ago based on our zoning, making sure that our zoning is building towards what we want to have in 50 years. So having some of that, like Olivia was talking about, some of that local piece, like do people have like food within walking distance that they feel good about or you know, getting their groceries locally and things like that. So just making sure that our city on a minute scale works for walkability and works for folks who don't own a car um, and without making it more complicated, more time consuming than if you did own a car. So I think making sure that our incentives are aligned and making sure that that feels equitable, which I think actually making things for walking and biking does help some of the like lower socioeconomic folks in our city as well, some of the working class families. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, you know, I think for me, um, this question is really, you know, we have to acknowledge the urgency that, that we need to have uh, to address the climate crisis, um, while also making sure that the transition is, is a just one. And, um, you know, I think I, for me, this is a, a question of um, collective solutions, uh, mass transit, and not sort of... Um, taking steps that are, are, are easy to take um, just because they're maybe less expensive or um, you know, don't really get us uh, where we need to be in terms of meeting our climate goals um, or you know, forcing individuals to make lifestyle choices, um, but really sort of um, making it easier for folks to get around without, without needing a, uh, an uh, individual uh, automobile. Um, and I think, you know, we're making some progress there, but I think we need um, more regional and state investment uh, in transportation. Uh, I do agree that we need to make uh, our, our public transit continue to keep it free, but also to um, make it more convenient so that um, the bus routes are running so consistently that it makes more sense to, to ride the bus than it does to, to drive or to walk. Um, you know, I think we need to make sure that as we're um, putting bike lanes in around the city that they're able to be used uh, uh, 12 months out of the year. Um, and, you know, really making sure that um, we are taking those steps to uh, 
upgrade our electrical grid and uh, all of our infrastructure on the city so that it is um, brought into the 21st century because we have so much aging infrastructure that is terribly inefficient. So those are some of the areas that I hope to focus on uh, going forward here. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, um, how do you plan to work toward racial equity in Burlington? And what do you see as some next steps in that, in that work? And Joe. Great. Um, you know, uh, this is uh, a question that I've thought a lot about um, since my campaign over the summer and before then, um, you know, what are the areas in Burlington where we can make some pretty immediate changes um, to, to deliver racial equity? I think um, Director Green and the REIB uh, office have done a pretty great job of making lots of changes to the way the city operates. Um, I think we can go a lot further on the council in terms of um, making it easier for um, BIPOC folks to serve on our boards and commissions and our, our NPAs. I think that is a, a crucial piece of this that uh, we need to make a lot of um, uh, effort to address because that's where so many of our decisions are made locally. And uh, if we don't have diverse voices in those rooms, then, um, then uh, our city isn't really working for everyone who lives here. So um, that is one particular area where I had said I wanted to focus on in my last campaign, and that is something that I um, really intend to make a priority going forward. Thank you. So, Raya. Yeah, I think that a huge part of this is um, kind of continuing to push some of the changes that especially Taisha Green has been championing. So I think, you know, to the like, and it is usually things that seem pretty basic, like making sure that um, we do have like pay our boards and commissions so that they can volunteer things like we have very, very few, like, for example, black employees in the city. And now the vast majority of them are employed by the REIB. So I think changing some of our, our HR practices to make sure that we are recruiting in more diverse ways and ways that supports um, a more diverse city staff, um, I think is some of the basic thing. And then I think honestly supporting some of the, um, I think especially, you know, some of the BIPOC staff and especially Taisha Green and Karen Durfee who are trying to implement these changes and just continuing to give them the resources that they need and continuing to give them um, the, uh, the other support that they need in order to make the changes that they're planning on doing anyway. I think there's a lot of work, great work being imagined um, by those two folks in particular, but also more broadly across the city and making sure that even once this moment in time feels a little less urgent that we continue to make those things a priority. Thank you. Olivia. Hi, again. So <laughs> I think I agree with a lot of what has been said. I specifically, uh, the NPAs are a huge thing um, as someone who is on it on the steering committee it's really hard to get people to, to come, to join. I personally am the only woman in my NPA steering committee. Um, I think there's a real lack of diversity in those areas, but part of that is because it's a time commitment. That is something that is not accessible to everyone. I personally, throughout the, the whole pandemic that we're still experiencing, have been in awe of the mutual aid that has come up around the city and I would really want to see a way to support uh, more community-based projects and programs and things that are are working because the people who need them are creating them so I would really like to see more mutual aid support throughout the city um, I guess the last thing is really more support for BIPOC owned businesses uh, I think that we need to really support our locally owned businesses and give them the support that they need to really do well and, and excel in our city. Thank you. Um, Allie. 
Yeah, um, this is definitely, I'm really glad that this question came up because this is definitely an important um, thing that we need to be talking about. Um, and I think I, I think in terms of like, I'm a very systems level thinker. And so, um, you know, Burlington is definitely part of this like larger, um, just like systemic, like oppression that exists in our country. Um, and I think there have been some really great points made here, um, especially like we have so many wonderful um, activists and um, business owner owners and leaders within our community who, um, you know, are, are members of the BIPOC community as well. And um, really just like uplifting those voices and making um, whether it's positions within um, our like within within like our own government, our own party, like making space um, there, or or whether it's encouraging others um, um, to make space, and also really deferring to these people who um, you know are are experts in this this subject or or have that lived experience. I think um, is going to be crucial. Um, yeah, and I I really um, yeah I, I really like Olivia's um, idea. Like I want to echo that of supporting like BIPOC own um businesses and also um like Soraya and Joe have mentioned like so many people I'm still learning about a lot of the people in our community who um are really active in like um pushing for policy change um but also like I'm I'm definitely committed to um this this issue and um deferring to people who have much more experience than I do in this area great thank you Jean that brings us to you so um not a surprise that people have said some essential things and I, I really support them. So let me just um, sort of go off of what Zariah said in terms of the REIB um, and echo that, but also add that that means that their strategic plan that they've just been shopping around and, and talking about needs to have the full support so that they can implement it. That means that the city has a real commitment to putting the money into that. Um, I look to them, I look to the Racial Justice Alliance uh, for, um, for guidance in this. And that means to me, doing things like supporting the Richard Kemp Center, the city has made uh, certain um, noises re regarding that. I think that we need to, uh, to, to follow up on that. And Zariah was critical in the passage of the public safety resolution. And that talked about the reallocation of monies that we've saved um, into social and racial equity projects. And that does not seem to be happening to an extent. And there may be lots of reasons, but we gotta continue to highlight that because this is, you know, paying cops overtime is a poor excuse for making the systemic changes that we need to uh, to make in terms of public safety in the fullest sense and that leads to the whole question of the uh, of economic justice and so the city has failed in its overarching um uh economic um development strategy we just walked away from that and a big piece of that is the uh the bipoc um uh, empowerment. So I would like to see that. I could go on. Uh, let me just add, let me end by saying that independent uh, control of police is absolutely important and we need to pass that independent control board. Thank you. All right. Um, so one last question and is what do you see as the city's continuing role in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and helping people who've been through the last two years? And what do you think an equitable response looks like? Um, and we will start with Ali this time. Yeah, um, so as I mentioned, I um, have been an educator in, in public schools. I um, worked full time um, just over in Colchester School District um, for a while. And um, really where my mind goes when I when I think about the ongoing COVID um, crisis is, uh, is our schools and um, our educators and our students and our families. Um, and, you know, recently there's, you know, um, like there's, going to be a halt to contact tracing that's coming. And I know um, myself and a lot of my colleagues are feeling incredibly uh, 
concerned about this. And um, also I've seen just, you know, students who are having trouble obtaining um, testing and really so like thinking about how can we continue to make these mitigative um, like measures available um, to people in our community and, and also um, taking into account from um, like our constituents and also from, um, you know, professionals who work in healthcare or, um, you know, education, um, like what, what are the barriers? Like what are, you know, what are you all feeling in this, um, this crisis? Like what's needed, I think, um, yeah, just deferring to people who are, who are really interacting with this on a daily basis. Um, is, is certainly my, my strategy. I would love to hear um, more from, from folks. Thank you, Olivia. Sure, I think uh, Burlington as a city really has an obligation to address the misinformation that comes around COVID masks and vaccines. I think we are not a stranger to this. I think Burlington likes to believe that we aren't that way, but as we've seen in the more recent school board meeting, there are a lot of people pushing misinformation. I don't have a magic answer to how to solve that, and I really wish I did, but I think that going forward, we've learned that this pandemic is unfortunately a part of our life, and whatever the city can do to combat misinformation and keep everyone informed would be really great. Thank you, Zoraya. Yeah, I think, or at least I think and hope that what has come out of the pandemic is a little bit more empathy for where people are at, regardless if that's, you know, being in a financially hard place because you've lost your job or if that's being, you know, like needing additional mental health care. And so to go back to something that Jean has said, I hope that we take some of the money that we've been using as a city I mean, there's lots of things I hope would happen at a federal level, but at a local level, I hope we've been we can take some of the money that we've been using to do command and control and to try to control those situations and rather to have more empathy based um, solutions to some of those things. So just having, you know, more services that are really meant to be for folks who aren't doing so well and having that be okay. Um, and having that be something that could happen to anyone um, and providing, providing some of those services on a municipal basis. Thank you. Uh, Jean. I, I really like that last idea that uh, Zariah said, you know, the idea of us being able to somehow have mental health clinics and other ways of getting into um, to, to be helping people who are, who are struggling now um, is, is something that we need to be uh, more dynamic and innovative. Um, uh, you know, I, I just reading the, uh, the CDC is talking about uh, cloth masks not being as effective as N95s. And my wife, Wendy Co, made lots of masks. They're great masks. They're really sort of thick, wear them all the time. But if they're not so good, it's like really hard to get them. Perhaps the city could use uh, some of the, some monies to facilitate, particularly for folks in, uh, in the old North End who don't have the money and elsewhere who don't have the old money, the King Street area, um, to be able to get masks that uh, are hard to come by in the in the market if we can pool our resources that's what public is about um you know uh the mask mandate was a good uh job by the city council and we need to continue to do that i mean i, I think the city has actually done a uh, a pretty good job of being um active in this and i want to continue that so uh if we need to facilitate more testing sites, that would be uh, helpful. Um, those are the ideas that I've got. Thanks. Thank you. And Joe, over to you. Thanks, Selena. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is, you know, as we're finding out, we can't really vaccinate our way out of this pandemic. And um, I think it's really unfortunate that, uh, 
the Scott administration didn't take action to provide municipalities all of the tools that could make it easier for, for us to respond to the pandemic, um, especially this new Omicron uh, variant. Um, so, you know, I will continue to push for um, more action on a state level, um, in both, you know, in terms of our ability to respond to the pandemic and uh, the tools that our schools are getting um, to make parents feel safer about sending their kids into schools, make kids feel safer about attending school. Um, so I think what Ali said there is critical. Um, and what Zariah said was also critical in terms of um, providing some of these services that um, we've seen throughout the pandemic are, are crucial to uh, the health and well-being of, of our people and uh, really expanding the definition of what that looks like. Um, you know, I think it uh, to have hazard pay have lasted for as short a time as it did when so many of our workers are still on the front line um, is really um, is terrible. And I think we need to look at ways that we can um, uh, provide some more economic relief to uh, low wage workers uh, in Burlington, but across the state. Um, I think we also need to revisit paid family medical leave because I think we've seen, especially with the changing guidance around uh, this new variant that, um, you know, five days might not be enough to quarantine. And if somebody needs to quarantine and they can't work, then uh, their ability to pay their bills becomes uh, really difficult. So I want to see us uh, take action there. There's not a lot that the city can do on some of those larger programs, but if we're vocal about it, I think we can um, make a lot of those changes that we need. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been really inspiring to hear all of your ideas and thoughts and, and in the um, case of our incumbents, your current work on, on some of these issues. I just wanna say as at the state level, I, I'm excited to partner with you all. I think there's a lot we can do together, starting with getting those just cause and thermal charter changes moving. I believe there's a hearing coming up on the Burlington charter changes this coming week in Montpelier. Um, I'm also excited to link arms with you. We have in the legislature, we're gonna be looking at a climate action plan that I think is gonna ultimately really require that we get more partnership and with and more resources toward municipalities to help us really meet our goals as a state and on and on from justice reform to also pushing for a stronger, more equitable COVID response across the state. So just really inspiring to hear all your ideas and think about how we as progressives and beyond could be working together at the municipal and state levels. And with that, I'm gonna ask you all to to do um, just a final closing statement. Any last thoughts you want to share or anything you want us to know about you? And then this time I'm just going to go in ward order. So Zariah, you're first, ward one. Yeah, just um, excited for, again, I think same thing that I started with even is excited for this group of people, um, just excited for continuing to have that balance on city council and being able to really have some pushback on the way the administration is doing things, but also some really fruitful conversation across the aisle um, with Democrats and independents and getting some really great policy across. So excited for this group of folks. Thank you. Thank you. So Ward 2, that's you, Gene. Well, this is like part of a stump speech, so it's going to sound like that. Uh, we can have an affordable Burlington if we have a city government that works for all and not just the privileged few, but we have much to do. There are powerful elites who do not believe in democ that democracy can solve our problems. They believe only in the market. I believe they have failed us. And let me be clear, austerity is not the solution to our affordability crisis. Neither is the trickle down market approach. We need an active and innovative democracy to solve it and to address climate change with the urgency that that demands. All of us are needed to make fundamental change and I've worked with many of you and together we can do so much more. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Selena. Thank you for moderating tonight and I'm really glad to see such a strong group of uh, 
potential candidates for uh, for progressives going into March. I think it's evident by the uh, issues we've discussed here tonight that we as progressives do have a clear view, a vision for um, what a just and equitable future looks like for Burlington and uh, really advocating for trauma-informed practice um, and harm reduction and all of the policies that we're, that we're working towards. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with everyone here and uh, everyone uh, in the city to, to make that happen. Hey, Olivia. Uh, I forgot that we skipped so many wards. <laughs> um, again, my name's Olivia Taylor. I want to be Ward 7 City Councilor because I believe in affordable housing, building community, and supporting local businesses. I think I have what it takes because I have personal, professional, and academic experience in policy, business development, and conflict resolution. I'm super excited to be seeking this nomination. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. And Allie. Thank you. Thank you all for um, making this happen. I definitely um, am feeling very energized um, by this. And um, yeah, I, I just feel, I feel very inspired by you all. And um, I've also felt inspired as, as a teacher and a social worker to, to run by my students and um, my neighbors and service users, my colleagues, my friends, and just so many others. Um, and I really firmly believe that Burlington can serve as an example when it comes to so many of these important issues. And we need leaders now more than ever who are going to stand for, for what matters. And, you know, as, as Helen Keller said, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And so I'm definitely feeling super energized. And yeah, so again, my name is Allie House and I'm, I'm looking forward to running for Ward 8. Great. I'm feeling really energized too. <laughs> this, is, this is great. This is just such a great group of people and, and um, so many great ideas and such commitment around these really important issues. So I just want to close by thanking you all so much for stepping up for the work you're doing and wish you the best of luck as you move into the Progressive Caucus this Tuesday and beyond. Thank you. Josh, do you want to give any closing final reminders about just how to participate in the caucus for folks before we, we sign off? Sure, yeah. So um, just a reminder again, the caucus, um, for online registration for the caucus, that closes Monday at midnight, so tomorrow at midnight, and then the caucus is going to take place at 6 p.m., so on, uh, on Tuesday the 18th. So if you do want to register to participate in the virtual caucus, um, you have to sign up online. The link is right now floating around on our Facebook page. If you're watching the live stream on our Facebook page, um, it's also posted in the comments. Um, so you can just register there. Um, if you, for some reason, if you or anyone you know have trouble participating virtually, don't have internet access, maybe there's an English language barrier, something like that, we will also have an in-person option, two in-person options, in fact. The first one is going to take place um, from 5.30, p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, on Wednesday at our office in the Soda Plant parking lot. The second option is going to take place from um, 8.30 a.m. Um, to 10.30 a.m. also at our office in the Soda Plant um, on Pine Street in Burlington. So feel free to stop by. And then um, if you do register virtually, we'll send an email out to you um, on, um, on, on Tuesday morning or Monday morning, the 18th, um, Tuesday, Tuesday, the 18th, <laughs> sorry. Um, you'll get an email with the Zoom link and you'll be invited to participate in that. So thanks so much for every, everyone participating and joining. This has been an awesome, awesome time. I'm really excited. And I hope folks are gonna get really involved in this, in this campaign because it's really, really important. The direction of our city, you know, is really at stake here. So um, I'm excited by the strong state candidates that are interested in the nomination. And I look forward to working with all of you to kind of bring it home in March.